Professor Gray, your new book focuses on the central impact that free play has on the child's emotional and social development. Can you summarize in the ways in which free play impacts their development? Yeah, a play really is the is the way that children learn how to get along with their peers. I mean, that's one of the major functions of play. <laughs> how, how else can children learn that? This is how they make friends. This is how they learn to see from other points of view, because children are really strongly motivated to play with other children. They come into the world with this enormously strong drive. Children, all normal children everywhere, want to play with other kids. When they're playing with other kids, because it's play, and you're always free to quit, <laughs> the other kids are going to quit. If you don't pay attention to their needs as well as your needs. So you've got to learn in social play, even if you're just three years old, how to attend to the needs of the other person and satisfy your needs in play while not violating the other person's needs. That's the most important social skill that any of us can develop. It's one of the most important skills all of us have to develop to live a successful human life. And that children are practicing that all the time. You know, the, the, the essential freedom of play, of what I call free play, which is real play, is that you're always free to quit. And because every child is free to quit, Every child will quit if they feel bullied, if they feel not listened to. So there's this constant force for learning how to attend to the needs of other people, learning how to, you know, seeing from others' perspectives. So that's a good part of it. Also, all play has rules. And when you're playing socially, the rules are social. It doesn't matter what kind of, you know, this is not just r games with formal rules. All play has at least implicit rules. You're playing a game of house, <laughs> and there's certain structure to this game, and you have to stay in character, and so on and so forth. So children are practicing in play how to abide by socially agreed rules, the rules of this game. This is, a, a, this is a, another extraordinarily important skill that all of us need to develop to live a normal, healthy life. And how else can you learn it? You learn, kids learn it in play. So that's, that's at least part of the social development. The emotional development, play is the place where children are in control of their own lives. <laughs> where they are making decisions, where they are solving their own problems. If there's, as long as there's not an adult standing nearby and stepping in and solving it for them, children have to solve their own problems in play. They learn that they can do things. They learn that they can control themselves. They develop what uh, psychologists call an internal locus of control. And that internal locus of control we know from all kinds of clinical research is essential for healthy um, psychological development. People who don't have this sense that they can control things, that they are in charge of their life, are very prone to depression and anxiety because they feel that they're victims of fate around them. Play is the one place where children are not being controlled by somebody else. They are in control and they're learning how to be in control and they're learning this internal locus of control. So that's part of the emotional development. In addition to that, think how often children play at what we think of as dangerous things, right? They climb too high in trees, they jump off of cliffs, they skateboard down banisters. They do these things that, you know, that frighten parents. Parents are better off not looking. <laughs> but all mammals do this. Other animals do this too young animals. And what are they doing? In part, they're developing their physical abilities to do these things. But also, in part, what they're doing is they're learning how to experience fear and realize that they can tolerate fear, that they can get over it. So that the child climbing a tree is climbing just to the point where the fear is barely tolerable. He feels frightened, but he's experiencing that fear, and then he's coming down and he's realizing, I can handle that. I don't have to panic with, from fear. And so both young mammals, young mammals of all types, including young humans, are learning how to control their emotions, and particularly fear. They're also learning how to control 
anger because in social play inevitably there's conflicts that arise. But if you lash out in anger, if you lose control of your anger, or you have a tantrum of some type, the play ends, and you don't want the play to end. So that's a powerful force to learn to control your anger, to learn to that, okay, okay I'm feeling this anger, but I'm not going to let it go because that will ruin the play. It's very interesting that when you deprive, uh, we can't do these experiments with children, but with other mammals, we've done experiments where you deprive young monkeys or young rats of the opportunity for social play, by, by, either by simply preventing them from interacting with other youngsters that play of their species, or by, um, or by only presenting them with non-playful playmates. And you can make them non-playful by injection of a certain drug that doesn't knock out other kinds of their behavior but knocks out play. When, when animals are deprived of play, then when they develop and you put them in a moderately fearful situation, they overreact with fear and they don't adapt to that fearful situation. You put them in a moderately anger-producing situation, put them with another, a, a strange animal of their species, even if that other animal is making friendly overtures toward them, they act with a combination of fear and aggression and they don't know, they are unable to control those emotions. So the evidence is really very strong that play is is nature's way of teaching young mammals and particularly young humans because we have to learn these lessons even more than other animals do because of the nature of our way of life. How to get along with others of our kind and how to control our emotions so that we can deal effectively with the real life fearful and anger producing situations that, that, that are inevitable in all of our lives. You have done extensive research on free play among hunter-gatherer children. What strengths and skills do you believe that children develop as a result of being raised in a hunter-gatherer society? Yeah, um, first of all, let me just comment on hunter-gatherer societies. Hunter-gatherers live in band societies. Sometimes people talk about hunter-gatherer tribes, but that's a little bit of a misnomer. These are band societies. These are the people who live in bands of typically 20 to 50 people per band, counting children. Each band is completely politically autonomous. It's not controlled by any larger ruler. And within each band, decisions are made by consensus. There's no chief, there's no big man as there is in tribal societies. So these band societies have been found and studied in many parts of the world. Most of them are gone now, but even as, even as uh, recently as 30 or 40 years ago, it was possible for anthropologists to go out and observe these band societies. Now the characteristics of a of that are required to be a good citizen in a band society are that you be willing to share and cooperate. These people absolutely depend upon sharing and cooperating. Every they couldn't survive without it. That if you if you kill a large animal, you don't own it. You share it. It belongs to the whole group. The, this is it's in the nature of the hunter-gatherer way of life. If you're gathering and you you, you gather a large, um, uh, you, you find a large amount of a particular kind of um, root that's edible, you share it with the others. The whole process, the band cooperates in raising children, they cooperate in their means of hunting and gathering, they share information. That's crucial to their way of life. So cooperating and sharing are essential to hunter-gatherer cultures and also having an egalitarian attitude. Hunter-gatherer cultures are extremely resistant to anybody who acts as if they're a big shot, anybody who acts as if they're better than somebody else. Well, my our argument is that children in play are learning precisely these character traits. Just as I said before, they're learning how to cooperate, they're learning how to share, they're learning how to see from one another's perspective, and they're learning that they can't try to lord it over people in play because the other people will say, no, you can't do that. You, 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 uh, we're, we're just not going to play with you. So the very kinds of skills that I just said are 
accented social and emotional skills are really especially important to hunter-gatherer cultures. The ability to control your emotions, and anthropologists have commented over and over again at the incredible emotional control that hunter-gatherer children and adults have, that they can be in terribly frightening situations and terribly painful situations and yet maintain their calmness, maintain their ability to think clearly, to solve problems. They don't panic in these situations as we do. So that's part of what they're learning. But in addition, in the ways that they play, they're learning this, the uh, survival, all, this, all the uh, sustenance and artistic skills of their culture. These are in many ways very rich cultures. They have art and music, they have dances, and of course, the, and of course to survive, they need to hunt and to gather, and these are very difficult skills. They need to know how to track animals, they need to know how to identify the several hundred different species of animals that are re relevant to their, to their tracking and their hunting. They need to know the, the many, many different kinds of, um, of uh, vege vegetations that they, that they survive on and how to find them and when to find them. There's a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill that goes into it. And children are practicing these all the time in play. They look out into the world around them. They see what adults are doing. They see what older kids are doing. And they incorporate that into their play. So the little boy, in a, in a culture where the men hunt with bows and arrows, the little boys are constantly practicing with bows and arrows, not because anybody is telling them that they have to practice bows and arrows, but because this is fun. This is what they, they're doing. They're pretending that they're hunters, and they're in the, in the process learning to hunt. And they're also pretend, going out on gathering trips in play and learning that. They're playfully cooking. They're playfully building dugout canoes, if it's a culture that uses dugout canoes. They're playfully building huts. They'll often build a little play village near the temporary village of, of the band itself. They are also playing out the arguments that they hear among the adults. So their play is, it's very interesting to me that natural selection endowed the young of our species not only with a drive to play, but with a drive to play at the very things that seem to be important in the culture around you. So hunter-gatherers play at hunter-gatherer things. Our children, when they have the opportunity, play at things like computers and things that are important to our culture. So, and they are also, of course, playing the musical instruments. They're playing with the art workings. They're the, if they're, it's a culture that creates beadworks, they're playing with that. They're playing in all the kinds of skills that are valued in, in their culture, and that is how they become educated. Your book highlights the success of schools like the Sudbury Valley School. How does this school mirror the characteristics of the hunter-gatherer society? Yeah, well, well, Sudbury Valley School, as you may know, is a school here in Massachusetts, in Framingham, Massachusetts. It's been around for 45 years, so it's uh, not an experimental school. It's a school that has hundreds and hundreds of graduates, and I've been um, observing the school for a long time. I had a graduate student who did a, his doctoral dissertation uh, based on spending um, uh, about 100 days at the school making observations. Um, and. Um, and I, have, I did a study of the graduates of the school many years ago. So this has been a focus of a lot of my study. Now, what, here, here's the way that Sudbury Valley is like a, a you, you know, you hear, this, you hear about this school, and if you don't know anything, if you haven't given a lot of thought to it, it just sounds crazy. I mean, here's a school that violates all of our basic societal views about education. The kids are not told what to do. <laughs> they are free to play and explore all day long, just like hunter-gatherer kids are. In hunter-gatherer bands, parent, adults do not tell kids what to do. They really don't. <laughs> they, by the age of four, children are regarded as having common sense, being able to make their own decisions. They don't have to be watched by adults. <laughs> They're off playing with the other kids by the age of four. Interestingly, Sudbury Valley regards the age of four as the minimum age that they would take. You've got to be four in order to have enough sense to be able to be a student at this school is the general belief. So there's something about four, apparently, when kids have incorporated language enough, they're able to control themselves. So 
the philosophy of education at Sudbury Valley is the same as the philosophy of education on hunter-gatherer bands. The belief, if you have to ask a hunter-gatherer how do children become educated, they will say they teach themselves. They learn through their observing around them, their playing and their exploring, and they become educated. Uh, we might help them out if they ask for help, but basically they're in charge of their own education and it works. We, we've, you know, the hunter-gatherer adult will tell us that they all learn, <laughs> you know? We don't have to worry about that. And that's what the people of Sudbury Valley will tell you, that the kids play and explore. The main thing that the adults have to do is stay out of their way, <laughs> don't intervene, let them do what they want to do. And so you go there at any given time of day and you would say that it was recess. You know, the kids are playing outdoors, they're playing indoors, some kids are reading, but they're obviously reading what they want to read. Some kids are having discussions and they may be highly intellectual discussions, but it's on their own topics. Um, so, so there's that going on. There is also, what, here, there are certain characteristics that I list in the book that I think represent the optimal kind of environment that children need in order to use their instincts to educate themselves to best advantage. And here's what they are. One of them is freedom to play and explore, which I've just been described, infinite freedom to play and explore. Another one is being trusted by the adults, this sense that there's a certain self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are trusted, everybody says you're trustworthy, you become trustworthy. The feeling like I really am in charge of my own life because nobody else is taking charge of my life. So that's part of it. The opportunity to really play with the real tools of the culture. So hunter-gatherer children can play with bows and arrows and knives and fire and the things that are the tools of their culture and therefore thereby learn how to use these things. Children at Sudbury Valley School play with the tools of our culture, computers and books and cooking equipment and woodworking equipment, all the kind, various kinds of tools that are valued in our culture. And that. Uh, um, access to experts, not being able to see people who can do these things really well. In hunter-gatherer culture, the children are, can observe the adults and see how the adults do these things, or they can observe older children who are farther along in, in their playful uh, activities at these things, and they can learn from them. Similarly, at Sudbury Valley, there are fewer adults per child at Sudbury Valley far fewer, but there are always older kids who are much farther along and the kids are learning skills from the older kids and to some degree from the adults. So the age mixing is key in both environments. A school like Sudbury Valley couldn't possibly work if all the kids were the same age. It works because there are kids from age 18 down to age four. And in their play, they're often playing across broadly age-mixed groups. And the little kids are learning from the bigger kids naturally in the course of play. And the bigger kids are learning how to be caring and nurturant through their interaction with the younger kids. So, and that occurs the, similarly in a hunter-gatherer band. That all the anthropologists who've, uh, who've studied children's play in hunter-gatherer bands talk about it as always being age-mixed in a broad range of ages. And so they're playing in ways in which the little kids are always learning from the bigger kids. So that's a, that's a, a really key part. Of it. And then one more thing, which I think is really, really essential. Both a hunter-gatherer band and the Sudbury Valley School are fundamentally moral, democratic communities in which the child is respected as a real part of this community. Growing up in a stable, moral, democratic community is, I think, absolutely essential to all aspects of human development. Emotional development, the sense of security that comes from it, the sense of safety that comes from it, acquiring moral values of the community, the sense that there are right and wrong ways to behave. And you can see this represented in the behavior of the adults as well as in the behavior of the older children, and you become socialized into that as you're, as you're growing up. And you feel like you are part of this community. At Sudbury Valley, you're part of it because you have a vote on every rule that's made in this community. There are no rules except those made in which, whether you're four years old or 17 years old or you're a 50 year old staff member, every member of that community, the staff and the students, has one vote. 
There are 140 students and 10 staff, so fundamentally it's the students who are the voting force here. So, that, so those characteristics, I think, are, are the set of characteristics that allow children to really take charge of their own education and to educate themselves well to become um, adult citizens in the culture in which they're developing. What factors have led to the decline of free play in the school environment? Yeah, I think there's a, num I think there's a number of factors. Um, I think for one thing, there's a kind of a, <clears throat> there's a kind of a self-engendered growth of schooling. You know, schooling is an institution. <laughs> and it's an institution that among other things tends to convince people that they need schooling. <laughs> And so we have now had, you know, we're now three or four generations into compulsory schooling. So most people in our culture don't know what it would be like not to have it. <laughs> so as a consequence, we tend to think more and more that children learn by being schooled. Well, therefore, if we want them to learn more, we have to school them more. <laughs> And if at, as part of this, we have, in, especially in recent times, with No Child Left Behind is a, is a prototypical example, of, but there were other you know, less obvious examples before, we've kind of turned to this notion that education should be measurable. And it's, in my mind, it's a silly idea because each person's education in reality is different. Education is sort of bringing out your own abilities and figuring out your own way of modeling the world and finding your way in the world. And different people are, are naturally going to learn different kinds of skills and different kinds of abilities. But we have this view that, that it should be measurable, which means it has to be standardized if it's going to be measurable. So we're putting everybody through this same standard track and measuring everybody. And, and now we're evaluating teachers, too, on how high those scores are. Well, when you're in that situation, administrators know they've got to raise test scores. Teachers know that. Kids know they've got to get high test scores. The whole goal becomes the test scores. Well, when you do that, you begin to not have time for play. <laughs> you begin to not have time. The, the, when I talk with teachers and, and even school principals, what they tell me is the reason we've had to do away with recess or why we've had to cut recess back is we don't have time for it. We've got to do all these other things to meet state standards, <laughs> to get these kids passing these tests. And so let me just, just backtrack a, a second and just to point out how big the change is. When I was in elementary school in the 1950s, we had six-hour school days, pretty much as today, although there weren't as many school days. We had no homework. There was nothing. There never was there homework for elementary school kids. There was little homework in, by high school, but certainly not in elementary school. But, but within the school day, only four of those hours were indoors. <laughs> we had a half hour recess in the morning, a half hour recess in the afternoon, and a full hour at lunch. And we were free to go anywhere we wanted. We could go home. <laughs> we, could, we could play on the school playground. We could go off into the woods and play there. We boys, uh, every boy carried a jackknife. We played with knives, you know. We played with fire sometimes. We weren't probably supposed to do that, but, you know, <laughs> that... <laughs> But there weren't adults watching us. We were more or less trusted at that time. And so be, because of the way this was spread up, there was never a time that we were more than an hour in our seats in school. <laughs> you'd have an hour, then you'd have a half hour recess, then another hour, then you'd have a full hour lunch, and similarly in the afternoon. So, so there's been a huge shift. At that time, it was very, first of all, it was very much up to individual teachers. So even within that hour that we were there, at a time a teacher might see that we were restless and just say, oh, I see everybody's restless. Why don't you just get up and play for a little while and then we'll get back to this <laughs> work. And now teachers just don't feel free to do that. Um, because they feel like, oh my God, if the principal ever looked in and this was going on, you know, I, w I could lose my job and unless my, those test scores are going to be really high anyway. And the principal is going to feel like if 
you know, if the superintendent of schools found out this was going on, they would lose their job. So there's this hierarchical pressure to keep kids focused on their work and that results in loss of play in school. One other factor that plays a role is the litigiousness of society. We no longer, tr we no longer feel that it's acceptable to let kids play on their own during school time because God forbid if a child gets hurt, there is the belief that the school system would be sued, <laughs> they'd be held liable. Um, there's, there's a great fear about that kind of thing uh, in, within the school system and within society in general. And that's one of the reasons why children don't have the freedom today that they once had. What factors have led to the decline of free play in the home environment? Yeah, the, the lack of play in home life, um, you know, again, let me just say something to indicate how much the decline of play is. The, the, um, Howard Chudikoff, who's a historian, wrote a book on the history of play in America, and he talked about the first half of the 20th century, uh, from about 1900 to about 1955, he puts for some reason as the date that things began to change. Uh, puts the first half of the 20th century as the, he calls it the golden age of children's play. And by about 1900, um, the necessity of child labor had declined enough and child labor laws were strong enough that we didn't have many kids working in sweatshops or working all the time <laughs> in mines or on farms and so on and so forth. So children had a lot more freedom beginning about then to play. It began to, to re-evoke the kind of hunter-gatherer view that children should be playing. This is what children are designed to do. And that view became kind of prominent among people in the early, in the early uh, 20th century. But over time, beginning around 1955, there has been a continuous shift in that attitude that we've forgotten what natural childhood is about, all about and that children are supposed to be out there playing. And we've developed, as I said before, this more, we might call it schoolish attitude <laughs> about child development. The children develop when they're directed by adults rather than develop through their own play and exploration and interactions with other children. So, so, and at that same time, and as school became more and more of a force, more homework, more intervention from school into the home, where where parents are more or less expected to be assistant teachers because they're supposed to monitor and make sure their kids do homework and sign off on the homework and so on. So as parents got more and more drawn into the whole schooling mentality, parents began to in more and more act in the way that teachers do. Their job is to teach the child and to be sure the child is taught even out of school. So, so kids more and more are, began to be put into, instead of just going out and playing, they're doing adult-directed things, adult-led sports or classes of various sorts outside of school. So that shift in attitude, that childhood, instead of being a time of joyous free play, is a time of sort of resume building, that shift in attitude, I think, has played a big role. But there are many other things that have played a role. The decline of neighborhoods that has played a role. Um, it's wonderful that women can get jobs today. <laughs> But one of the things that that means is that women are not home during the day as they once were. Nobody's home during the day. <laughs> and so people don't get to know one another in the neighborhood. And, um, and when people don't get to know one another in the neighborhood, then they tend to distrust the neighborhood. And in some sense, it becomes a little bit more dangerous. If you know everybody and there's somebody home, looking out the window and they can see that little Johnny's getting in trouble over there <laughs> or having trouble or fallen and hurt themselves, then that usually it would be a mother looking out the window, not necessarily Johnny's mother, <laughs> is, is, a, is there to protect him, to do something about it. And also, when there were more kids outside, there's a f there, just because kids in the neighborhood knew one another, when they came from, from school, they'd play outside, they'd play together all summer. With a lot of kids outside, there's safety in numbers. They are looking out for one another. They're protecting one another. 
you know, God forbid there would be some kind of a child molester or child snatcher around. He's not going to do it in front of witnesses, right? But if there's just a single child out there, that child probably literally is a little bit more in a little bit more dangerous. We greatly exaggerate the real fear of that, but nevertheless, there is some possible danger of that. And if there's not numbers out there, there's a little bit more danger. So it's a combination of factors. It's you know, it's also the litigiousness of, uh, again, once again, you know, we don't, we don't feel so welcoming as we want. It used to be that all the, all the neighborhood yards were free range for all the kids. You would play in anybody's yard. <laughs> you know, now we've got fences up. <laughs> we've got hedges. We've got ways of protecting private property. And we also even have laws saying that if you have something potentially dangerous in your yard, you have to keep children out or, or else you pay, or, or, if, or your insurance company will insist that you do because, because you might get sued if somebody gets hurt on your property. So, so there's a whole set of forces that has, made, that has worked against um, children's being able to play freely away from adults outdoors. And this, these have just been accumulating over time and there's been, as a result, a gradual but in the end dramatic decline in uh, opportunities for children to play freely outdoors especially. You assert that you're optimistic about the future of education. Can you talk a little bit about the trends that are making you optimistic? Well, I'm optimistic for um, several reasons. One is um, we are really beginning to see movement outside of the school system. I don't think the school system is going to reform itself. Um, it can't, I don't think. It's, uh, there's too many um, entrenched forces. There's too much self-interest and so on and so forth at every, at every level. There's, too many blinders on ways of thinking. I don't think the school system can reform itself. But what's happening is the school system has reached the point where more and more kids can't deal with it. We're drugging kids. There was an article just two days ago in the New York Times that now 20% of high school boys have been diagnosed with ADHD. 20%, one out of five, is given this classification of mentally disordered. I mean, you know, a lot of parents are recognizing that there's something wrong here. <laughs> this is really, this is really crazy, and it's not the boys who are crazy; it's the system who is crazy. <laughs> and so, so that's just one example. But many parents are recognizing my kid is just really unhappy in school. And instead of drugging my kid, instead of fighting with my kid all the time, I'm taking my kid out of school. Every single year, a higher percentage than the previous year, and this has been occurring over the last 10 years or so, uh, of people leave the uh, school for homeschooling of one sort or another. There's a certain amount of movement out to schools like Sudbury Valley, but those schools haven't really caught on as much as homeschooling and so-called unschooling, which is a kind of very loose homeschooling where the children really are in charge of their own education, but in a home base. But this is, this is increasing. We're now at something like 5% of the entire school population is being homeschooled. At some point, who knows exactly when it will be, there will be enough kids not going to school that practically everybody will know somebody who's not in school. It's a little bit like once people who are gays or lesbians came out, we reached the point where everybody knew somebody who was gay or lesbian. It became much harder to think that that's abnormal. <laughs> it became much harder to think that this, is, that this is not a normative kind of thing. So, so therefore, I think when people see more and more people who haven't gone to school and they're doing okay in life, then they'll be much freer about taking their own kids out of school. We've got this view in our society that you've got to do school or, or you're going to be like that, you know, that, imagine that, that dropout who can never get a job and so on and so forth. But when we see that there are people who have withdrawn from school, taken charge of their own education, and are doing well in life, 
more and more people are going to realize that they can do that too. And that way, they, ha they can preserve their own freedom. They don't have to be in this situation where they're constantly being told exactly what they have to study, how they have to do it, what tests they have to take, and so on and so forth. So that's part of it. Another thing that's happening is really the whole revolution of information availability. Information is so readily available. It's so easy to educate yourself these days. There's no need to go to school for it. And every kid knows it. <laughs> every kid knows it. You know, they, they, they can find whatever information they want on the internet and they can find it so easily. Of course, they have to use judgment as then and common sense to decide what to believe and what not to believe. But now, but the idea is that that information has become democratized. It's out there. You can find it. It becomes a lot easier for parents to believe that they can do homeschooling at home because there's so many resources available. There are courses available on the internet and so on that you can you can do. Um, so that's so I think so that's a that's a part of what what gives me optimism too. And then the other thing that gives me optimism is this. It seems as if over the last few centuries, there's been a kind of an inevitable course towards more freedom. When people see freedom as an option, they take it. There's no group of people who willingly puts themselves in the less free situation if they can be in the more free situation. And so we've seen that first with the overthrow of dictatorships and in governments. We've seen it with the gradual increase in democracy at the larger scale. We've seen it within this country where, you know, first freedom was just for, <clears throat> for white male property owners, right? The, the, the rights of democracy. And then, <clears throat> then it became available all to, finally to people who are African uh, descent. And then it became available to women. And now more and more we're recognizing the full rights of people regardless of sexual orientation. I think it's inevitable that we're going to recognize that children too <laughs> have these human rights, that they have the right to pursue, to follow their own pursuits, and they have the capability to do it. And so when parents and children themselves see that freedom in education is an option, it works. You don't have to take this bad medicine, this bad tasting medicine. You can do it without that, <laughs> that inevitably they'll choose that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the researchers who have most influenced your book? Yeah, I, I would say, um, well, let me start with some of the classics. Um, the w one work that's not, um, or actually two books that are not well known, by, certainly not by most psychologists. There's a um, philosopher and naturalist named Carl Gruss, who uh, more than 100 years ago, sort of the turn of the of the 19th to the 20th century, wrote a book called The Play of Animals, and then he wrote another book called The Play of Man. And he was well aware of Darwinian um, uh, um, theory, and he developed some ideas about what the function of play is in animals, much along the line that I've just described. And then with his book on the play of man, he developed these ideas with regard to, to humans. And he said, basically, you know, mammals come into the world without their final behaviors fully formed. We all have, all mammals, including human beings, have certain roughed out instincts. But we, re, we need to refine those instincts through our play. And in humans, we need to refine them in accordance with the culture around them through our play. And so all animals, he argues, play at the very things, the very skills that they need to develop, and that's how they develop those skills. And humans play not just at the skills that humans everywhere have to develop, like the social skills and the ability to speak and so on, but they also play at the skills that are unique to their own culture. They come into the world prepared to observe those things. Well, those ideas have kind of lain fallow all these years. And it was kind of an insight when I read Gruss. And so that did, 
play a role in, in my own thinking. And I, in some ways, I see myself as w standing on the sh shoulders of Carl Gruss in developing his ideas that have been more or less ignored, not so much by animal behaviorists, but by psychologists since then. Um, another uh, influence is Lev Vygotsky, the um, de Russian developmental psychologist who wrote in the, uh, in the 1920s. And he didn't write a book, but he wrote a wonderful essay on the role of play in children's development. And he's the one who talked about all play having rules and pointed out how children are acquiring rules through play, a tremendous insight which had a big effect on, on my thinking. Um, more recent people, uh, I've been um, influenced by anthropologists like Melvin Connor. Um, who uh, wrote a book a number of years ago called The Tangled Wing. Um, and it was based on his observations of um, children in a hunter-gatherer culture. And it was really more about, um, uh, about infants and how infants are treated. Um, it was also, though, generally about the culture at large. And that really is what got me interested in hunter-gatherer cultures, was reading his book. Another person, our own uh, Gilda Morelli, who's a colleague of uh, mine. She was in the psychology department. I think she's moved over to the education school now. But she um, did research with a hunter-gatherer group called the FA, and uh, it, was, it was very inspiring to me to hear her talk about the, uh, the way FA children played and how they learned. And t hearing her talk led me to do a more systematic survey of other researchers to see, is this unique to the FA? unique to the Kung that um, Melvin Connor studied, or is this generally true of all hunter-gatherers? And it led me to uh, do a survey of hunter-gatherer, of anthropologists who had studied a variety of hunter-gatherer cultures and put together my hunter-gatherer argument about <laughs> play as the means by which children educate themselves in those societies. So those are some of the people who have influenced me. One more that I, I really must mention is, is Daniel Greenberg, who is not so much a researcher as a real innovator. He's the, he's the person who, way back in the 1960s, founded the Sudbury Valley School, and he's written a great deal. He's, I, would, I would refer to him as a philosopher. He's, uh, he's re his own writings about, um, both about democracy and how, what it means to grow up in a democracy and how children need to grow up in a in a democratic environment in order to acquire the characteristics that we value in a democracy have very much influenced my own thought and research. Your research is relevant to a wide variety of audiences and social scientists. Is there a particular group that you're most hoping to influence? Yeah, I would say, the, I would say first of all parents, but closely related to parents everybody who cares about the happiness and development of children. And parents want their children to be happy, they want them to grow up healthy, they want them to be, and so I, so I see parents as the first line audience. <laughs> but people want, people who don't have kids want their nieces and nephews to grow up well too. And, we, and people who care about society want everybody to grow up, you know, well. So, so I see, I, I don't see I don't see uh, school administrators and so on as the primary. I hope they read it. I hope that they, I hope it. I hope that's meaningful to them. But that's not the primary audience. I think the primary audience is the general public, because in some sense the school system in a democracy is responsive to the general public. You know, it's really. In, I gave a talk just last night to a group of of teachers um, in Waltham. And they told me that parents are putting pressure on them to spend, to give more homework, to do this and that, you know. So they see, they see themselves as, in some sense, under pressure from society at large to move in a direction that they are themselves thinking is the wrong direction, that these kids need more chance for play. So I am trying to convince parents, no, your children need more play. <laughs> and it's very interesting that a lot of teachers, in fact, are saying that's precisely the message they want parents to get. So it's so parents really play a big role ultimately through their voting power, through their ability to choose school boards, through their ability to influence the decisions they're making, even at the highest political level. I mean, look at right now, 
whether it's George Bush or whether it's Barack Obama or whether it's Romney, the would-be president, they, they all are arguing for more schooling for kids, more testing. They're not talking about more play. And, and so we need to change the, we need to change voting, added, we need, if we change the attitude of the public, we will change, in a democracy, we will change the rhetoric and attitude of our leaders and that's how we change. <laughs> the system in the end. So that's primary my audience. I also am interested in reaching um, social scientists because I think there has been um, a dearth of uh, research on play that um, there, uh, I, I have documented in this in some places. There's been even among developmental psychologists who you would think would be very interested in children's play. There's been relatively little study of children's play, and I'm trying to encourage more academic attention towards play. Um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, when you ask me who are the big influences are in my work, they're mostly people who are writing a long time ago. We don't really have a lot of people writing very deeply about play today. <clears throat> Well, no, except for thank you for, <laughs> for your interest in this. And um, I've been very um, pleased with the reception of my book. It has had, um, you know, there were certain groups that I knew would be interested. The, the, you know, you talk about preaching to the choir, you know, the unschoolers and the Sudbury school parents and so on and so forth. I knew they would be interested. But I'm finding that it is generating a lot of interest among people who are discovering this book and think, and it's leading them to think about these ideas in some cases for the first time, or at least to think more deeply about these ideas. And that's what has been most gratifying to me so far. <clears throat>